everybody welcome back to our neck of the woods so as you can see from the title uh, above we've made some engineering mistakes that we need to go ahead and fix so let's get to it and i'll show you what we got going on So in the process of looking for the bracket that I need to attach these LVLs to the house uh, to support the trusses, I found out I made an engineering mistake. And to go over those brackets real quick, basically there's a bracket that's gonna go up there that sits like in the shape of an L. It's going to sit on the ICF top plate like this. Therefore, you nail down into the top plate and you nail into the face of the top plate. That bracket will then have a U shape on it that will be the width of three LVLs and the height of those LVLs. And then of course, through the side of that bracket, you'll nail in and you'll bolt those three LVLs together. And then we'll bolt, the, bolt those three LVLs together all the way out here. And then the LVLs will sit flush against the ICF house and they'll go up and sit on top of these six by sixes. And then again, like as you see these brackets right here, the bracket will bolt to the bottom of the six by six like this, and it'll bolt into the LVL like that. Now again, in my research to find these brackets online, you actually can't get them online. They have to be specifically made from Simpson. They're an extremely thick, heavy duty application. And the reason why we need something so strong is because we don't have something to really uh, go on to the ICF house uh, to support the roof or to support these LVLs. The other problem is because we only have a single wooden top plate up there, we need something thicker and heavier duty because you don't have like three inch nails going down through the top plate or through a double top plate going this way. But yes, you can use three inch nails going this way. So we beefed up the thickness um, of the steel so that you can only use like an inch and a half nail going down. And again, that's gonna support the LVL going out this way, which will then support um, trusses sitting this way on that LVL that are gonna run across the porch. So in my process of trying to find those online, I came across the picture of my um, floor joists. And if you don't remember, these are my floor joists brackets that sit against the wood here uh you get some nails in there and then of course you've got two nails on each side that go through these holes and go in at an angle well the first problem that i have is these brackets were sitting next to a bucket of nails and those nails were a uh they're called a 8d basically that means that it's 0.131 inches in diameter and they go through the bracket holes no problem. Well, unfortunately, right next to that bucket that I probably missed was this nail. This is a 10D. And if you hold them up side by side, you can see there is a pretty good difference in girth and in thickness. The 10D is 0.148 inches, but I ran that by the engineer and he said that the 8D will be fine. The difference is you're gonna lose some of your load uh, bearing that you're gonna have on this porch. Now, again, he ran it through calculation. He said, you're gonna be fine. It's not like our front porch, again, is gonna be holding 200 people up having a dance party. Yes, it's decreased a little bit, but there's nothing wrong with the 8D versus the 10D. Again, being a porch, if this were to be the inside of your house and you were to use these brackets, then yes, 110% you'd be wanting to use a 10D because you're gonna be having a lot more live load and dead load from furniture constantly sitting on it, people constantly walking around. That's the difference between live and dead. Um, and it would end up being an issue in the future. So yes, the, the, the 10D nails are what I used for the entire inside of my house. It's what's going into that triple main beam uh, going down, and it's what's going into the LVL um, through the bracket to hold up all my floor joists. So yes, everything in the house is a 10D, but again, unfortunately out here, I only ended up using 8Ds, but we shall, still should be fine. So while I dodged that engineering bullet, what I didn't dodge was 
I used one and a half inch nails. Now, obviously going that way into the house, we couldn't use anything longer than an inch and a half anyway, because we're only going into a single piece of lumber. Out here though, you obviously have a triple piece of lumber that yes, I could have used something longer because those nails are going straight in, they would have gone through, and obviously they're not gonna punch out the other side. The problem is, is the corner nails. The four nails, two on each side, the, those nails going in at an angle, they're supposed to go through the joists and into the front beam and the back beam. So unfortunately, you were supposed to use a three inch nail. Now, I figured the inch and a half would still have been fine because the nail is going into the joist and it's not like you can pull this joist into the house. That's not gonna go anywhere. But if I guess if you try to push a load hard enough on it this way and you were able to push the beam away from the house, then you would end up bending the bracket because the bracket's gonna wanna stay bolted to this, but that nail not going into the beam and it's only going into the joist, technically I guess you could have separation. So unfortunately, we have to remove every one of these inch and a half nails, get a three inch nail going in at an angle, so that way you help with the separation. Um, I think it's kind of pointless, again, because you can't separate the beam from the house going that way, or you can't push in any harder, and I doubt there's ever gonna be a force strong enough to push away, but I think we would fail inspection if they found out, hey, that nail is supposed to go at an angle. It is supposed to go into the, the front and back beam. And if they remove one and see that it's only inch and a half, they're gonna fail me. So why not just take care of it right now? So luckily for me, this is a very easy thing to do because I've got these little things. So these pliers I bought like 20 years ago to do some tiling work. And as you can see, when you pinch them together, they don't come all the way together. They're very sharp and they're basically made to chip and break porcelain tile. Now I've already tried one of these out and luckily I have these. You can simply grab onto the nail, pinching it, starting to pull it away. And then as you can see, as simple as that, we went ahead and rem removed the inch and a half nail. Now we can go ahead and put a three inch in. So that is what I plan on doing for the rest of the day. Uh, using these pliers, pulling out every nail. I have to go buy some more three inch 10D nails because I use them all on the inside and I don't have any left. So we're gonna pull them all out, reinstall the three inch, and then we'll, we ha will have avoided pretty much an engineering mistake that would have almost guaranteed a failure of my front deck. Well, I don't wanna do that ever again. Uh, so hopefully a mistake that will be avoided when we do the back of the porch and uh, I'll still have to fix the uh, deck over here. I'll pull some of those nails out. Uh, I believe that has six hangers in it total. Um, we'll have to do some side angles uh, on those ones too. But one other thing that I have to fix here, that's an engineering mistake. Uh, I've been debating or just delaying to do it just because it hasn't been top priority, is over here in this corner, and I'm sure some of you are gonna spot it right away. Uh, others, you're gonna take a minute maybe to figure it out. But let me go ahead and zoom in real quick, and who can figure it out the fastest? You see what's going on there and what I did? So basically, the bottom plate and the top plate are meeting up together and they're not overlapping. So that bottom plate, for example, on this wall over here should have run long and the top one should have run short. 
Therefore, the bottom one over here would have run short and hit the bottom plate over here, but the top one would have run long and gone over top of it. Now, the reason why I've been delaying on fixing it is because it's such an easy fix. Um, all I have to do is take a two by eight that sits on top of here. So this will actually be three ply thick. Uh, I don't have to go too far, only about say two, three feet or so and we'll run the third one then long going over top of that second one over there and then we'll screw down and that will basically take care of the overlap that I didn't do. So as you can see, very simple and easy fix. Just got to get around to doing it. And luckily I've got a two by eight board right there that's eight foot long. So I still have to use that to put in one more piece of blocking right there and then I'll use the rest to do that side and that side over there. So simple mistake, but completely easy fix to do. And we'll get cracking at that a little bit now or a little bit later. It's getting pretty cold and getting dark, getting time to make some dinner. But uh, I'll see you guys back here tomorrow and we'll probably go ahead and fix those two real quick. All right, so enough procrastinating. We're gonna finish this garage. We need to install these two king studs. We need to finish out those corners where I need to overlap the boards finish out that block and then I need to go down and get every single piece of blocking in here which I still need to go pick up two by sixes to do but today we're going to officially call this garage done to the point where we can start putting in uh, electrical running through the walls figuring out where our boxes are going to go uh, obviously it's too cold to start doing spray foam and I think that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put an inch or two of spray foam against the zip R panels and then we'll go ahead and put in just a cheap bat insulation after that. But the uh, spray foam should help seal up any of the corners and cracks where the wood meets all of the zip paneling and um, we need to figure out what we're gonna do for our trim boards here. Like if we wanna go with a PVC, if we're gonna take stone and wrap it around into here. Uh, but we need to start figuring all that out and getting this garage uh, ready to go because again, the windows are a week overdue, so they should be here any time. So we need to figure that out. And oh, and if you guys are wondering, yes, this is what I look like. I am absolutely covered in mud. Um, from what you can see going on right now, we got all of this dirt moved out. Uh, it is all back there behind the shooting stop now. Um, but it was just an absolute wet, snowy, rainy day. The skid steer was an absolute pain in the butt to clean. Um, the clay was so rock hard that in between like the frame rails and the tracks, it packed itself in there and I got the water hose out and water couldn't touch it. It was just absolute um, clay that would not absorb water and no mud at all. Uh, I could not clean it. I had to literally get in there and hand pick out pieces of clay at a time. And I ended up with probably 10 gallon buckets full of just clay packed in anywhere because if I didn't do it they were going to charge me an arm and a leg to return it like that so um, skid steer uh, track steer awesome but a wheel machine way easier to clean those tracks are an absolute nightmare if you're going to use one on tracks do it in the summertime when this stuff is more like a powder or don't do it when it's mushy, do it when it's uh, frozen outside because I never ever want to have to clean out one of those again. I was just covered in 20 degrees outside or roughly around, it was right around 30, 32 I think, but nothing was freezing. Um, spraying that thing down with water, covered in mud, uh, just an absolute nightmare. So uh, I am glad that is over with, but as you can see, we still have a pile to move. So let's get up here, let's start cutting. Let's go to the store and get some two by sixes. Or actually, I'll probably start using these two by sixes right here. I can take down these braces now. They're not needed for anything and we can get at least a few uh, of the blocking knocked out. So hang tight, we'll be at it.
so that's one side done. We got another king stud going all the way from the uh, top of the garage wall all the way up to the top. Um, got that two by eight extending over. But one thing I just noticed um, when we go ahead and hang metal roofing in here, which is what I want to go with, just because I hate drywalling and metal will be a lot faster, cleaner, and easier. As you can see, that two by eight is overhanging because obviously you've got an inch and a half of that end truss. Well, it's a good thing that's there because the studs here or the trusses are at the same height as what the bottom of this is. And that right there makes for a perfect inch and a half nailing surface now that it's overhung that I can attach the uh, metal roofing to. So I'm gonna have to get a two by eight to go all the way down there uh, to have something to attach to. On this side, it's not a problem because we're gonna screw in to the bottom of that common truss. So the metal roofing can attach underneath every single truss and under that one over there. But on that side, we've got nothing to attach to. So definitely gonna have to run some two by eights all the way across there. So we've got that inch and a half overhang and that will be a perfect nailing surface. So we'll have to figure that out later. But uh, I'm gonna go to the other side, knock that out. And man, that was kind of a pain in the butt. I did not enjoy doing that. That's probably why redoing a house probably costs more than just building one from scratch. Because pulling out all this stuff uh, is definitely no fun. So let's throw in another king stud and the uh, triple top plate and then we'll be done with that. The king studs are done. The upper triple plates bolting everything down now are done. And I've started on the blocking and holy crap, this sucks. So I can't just go out and cut a bunch of 22 and a half inches because some of the trusses are a little off. And then you've got the gussets that are in the way. Then you've got the hurricane straps and the other straps that I put down. Everything is just in the way, creating a big mess. And because I'm using two by sixes, it's very hard to um, push the two by six into the hole where it needs to go. And then hammer it flush and then get the nails in. Now over here, it's not a problem with these uh, uh, storage trusses because I'm not hitting the gussets. But the common trusses down there, the gussets are right where I need to be nailing and all the nails are hitting the steel and bouncing off so I can't get them in. Um, I'm not 100% sure what blocking is for. I don't think it's structural, which is what I originally thought. I think what they're for is, once this is in now in here, and as you can see, it's very tight, it's not going anywhere. I think when you start putting your insulation in, and in this case, we'll probably use blown in. So as they're doing the walls and coming up here, I'll probably have them shoot foam into here, along here, all the way up and over here. And the whole point of that is, is now this is fully insulated and you've got the wood connected to the wood, connected to the wood, all nice and spray foamed. But what we need to do up in here later is we've got to get those plastic uh, air channeling things in here. Basically, they're about four feet long going all the way up here. They attach to the sheathing or attach over into your truss and they basically create like an air gap. And if you don't put those in, what ends up happening is as air blows up through your soffit and gets in here, air comes down in here and can blow in all of your blown in insulation and completely blow that off of here. So if you've got drywall right here, you can have no insulation in here. And if you watch uh, the build show with Matt Reisinger, um, when he started to rebuild his house, he actually went on one spot up in his attic where that basically had happened. The wind came up, took all the insulation out of here. And if this was over top of a bedroom or kitchen or bathroom or whatever, you've got basically a complete freezing cold ceiling. So you put that air channel in. And if you look right here, there's a seam right here. So if we put that air channel down to about here, that means that our air channel will probably go up right about where that knot is as the next seam is right about there. So you can see from that knot all the way down to this height now, you can put in insulation and don't have to worry about it getting blown around. That air channel will take all the air up against the sheathing and that plastic or foam and take it all the way right up to the ridge cap. 
So I think, again, that's what the blocking is for. So the next thing that we need to do is once we get all these in, we can go buy those air channel things, stick those up in, and then that will basically keep birds out of here also. And I think these are sometimes referred to as bird blocks, but I guess it depends if you've got, you know, this completely open, which we're not gonna do. We are gonna put a soffit on here. So nothing can get up in there. A bird can't get up in there. Um, it's going to, uh, the truss is gonna go down like this. Then we're gonna put some two by fours and some soffits going straight parallel to the ground, going and connecting to the house. And that way air can get up under there, get in through tiny holes in the soffit and then blow up and go all the way up into the roof. So we've got two things to basically still do for the garage before we can get ready for spray foam, but it's too cold to spray foam anyway. But that's two things that we have to do. We've got to get those air channels in so they can all be spray foam together, locked in and airtight. And then of course, up underneath here, we've got to go ahead and build out um, a soffit. So we'll get some two by fours that will be parallel going straight in to here. And we can toe nail those in there or uh, run a two by six that will, or I'm sorry, a two by four that will be connected to the house this way. And then the two by sixes that will get toe nailed into the front fascia board and get nailed this way. Those two by fours can sit on top of it or, or sit underneath of it and we can nail them up into there. And then you go ahead and put on your soffit material and then that will be done. So a little bit more to do there and then uh, keep cracking at these, uh, um, these blockings. But I am a little over halfway. I've got one, two, three, four. I've got five more on this side and then I think I'm gonna run out of two by six. But oh my God, this sucks. This is a huge pain in the butt. I can't wait to be done with it. And hopefully when it all gets spray filmed, it's gonna look nice and pretty. And uh, this thing, this garage will be nice and airtight. So we got enough two by fours to go ahead and just have extra. Like I say, you can't ever have enough two by fours, uh, but we'll also have extra that uh, we need anything for the roofing. And we're gonna go ahead and build those soffits out, like I said, like in a triangle. You've already got the truss two by four or two by six, depending which truss it is, going off the house like this. But then we'll go ahead and take another two by four and attach it to the truss and run it against the house. And again, now you've built a triangle. So not that our snow load is really heavy around here, but uh, you basically have a triangle now that if there was a heavy snow load, because we've got two foot overhangs, you really can't push that down because the triangle is pushing back into the house, keeping that uh, end overhang upright. We've also got plenty of two by sixes to fill out the blocking. We've got two by eights to go ahead and put on that upper top plate so that we've got an inch and a half nailing surface for the uh, metal roofing uh, that's gonna go up for my ceiling in the garage so that you have a nailing surface. And yeah, I probably could have got away with like a two by six and just overhung it an inch and a half. But uh, I just like 
everything being the same so it was only four of them so it is what it is um, but we can put those two by eights up on the top plate push it against the end truss nailed down you've got an inch and a half overhang and it just makes it perfect and then we'll see how these uh, plastic uh, air channel things work um, I don't know if they just fit up in there with gravity like they're oversized on like the wing like inlets that they want to stick up once you push them up or if you have to use like a staple um, I think I've got inch long ones that I used on my shed and that's what I put up my sheet or single shingles on the gable ends for and um, if we turn the air power all the way down we won't have that staple blast through the plastic and go in and all the way into the wood if we turn it down where we leave like an eighth inch of that staple hanging out that it doesn't go through the plastic then that'll just make sure that the wind can't ever blow those around or they don't ever move uh, I don't think you need more than a few per uh, uh, air channel thing but uh, it should work. So we get back home, we'll install a few, see how tight they are. If not, we'll use the staples and then we'll finish out this garage today. All right, you guys are coming with me. Let's see how easy one of these are to install. Like I said, I don't know if these outside winglets are gonna just stick in by gravity or if we need to put something up in here. So no, it would probably fit. I don't know how wide we are right here, but it looks like we're gonna have to put a little staple in. And like I said, we're really gonna have to turn down the power because it looks like we're gonna have to nail straight up into the roof sheathing. And we definitely don't want a staple going up through the roof sheathing and uh, going all the way through. So we'll turn the power way down, angle the, uh, staple so that way we don't have any problems. Those are long. Well, it looks like we only got inch and a half ones, so we're really gonna have to put these at an angle and uh, not blow through the uh, roof sheathing. I guess if we do blow through the roof sheathing, it's probably not the end of the world because uh, we still have the ice and water guard to put on so before we lay the ice and water guard down if we see a, a staple sticking up through then obviously you can just hammer it down and make it flush so it shouldn't be too big of a deal. Not 100% sure how I feel about that, but that kind of gives you an idea that the staples didn't go too far in, but they are into the wood. So we can go ahead and kind of bend these down that this isn't gonna, gonna wanna really go anywhere. But you can see when we bring the spray foam around here, we'll spray foam all of this, closing this hole, spray foaming right here, spray foaming over there. We'll go down, over, over, and then all of this. And the air is forced to do nothing but go up through there and out. And the only way air 
to now get through is going down through the channel, which let me see if I can see it. Well, I hope that all makes sense. Um, I don't really know why you have to vent besides trying to keep your roof cool and the under part cool. Obviously air blows in underneath of that soffit, falls up that plastic and then can shoot on up. So if it's a hot day, uh, heat's obviously gonna rise. So it's gonna go up under there, go all the way up through the uh, gap in the ridge cap and the metal roofing that we're gonna do. Obviously the metal goes up to the top of that uh, sheathing too. And then you've got a cap that goes over top and goes down so nothing can get up and over and come on down and get the inside of your house wet or garage. But uh, I guess you want that air to be directed up. Uh, the only thing I wish I could do is if these things weren't so expensive, it would be nice to install these literally all the way up to the ridge cap right now because every spot where there's a gap in between the plywood, when the snow melts, the snow goes down four feet, finds a crack, and rains. Then it goes down four feet, finds a crack, and rains. If I could put these things all the way up to the ridge cap right now, uh, it couldn't rain anymore uh, in the garage because it would, the water would fall down on that plastic, get channeled all the way down, and then it would be raining on the outside of the house um, where the soffit's gonna go. So if they, like I said, if they weren't so expensive, that'd be nice to have uh, all of it there. Um, if you look up there though, you can kind of see them poking out. Therefore, you know, we're gonna be good. Uh, that air can flow up and under there. And then obviously it can't flow anywhere else because it's gonna hit that board right there, uh, the blocking, and it can't go anywhere. So the only air can go up and up through that channel and get all the way up and out the house. So I'm gonna continue on the other side now. I'm going to put those two by eights up there so we have something to nail into. And I'll probably have to get the spotlight out and finish up the rest of the night. But uh, hope that made sense. Hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, probably wrap this video up here. Uh, you guys see what mistakes I've made, what I've had to fix. And now uh, engineering wise, I think we're good to go. Once we hit a 50 degree day, we can start uh, getting the spray foamers in here and doing all what they have to do. And then, like I said, because they're only gonna put an inch or two of spray foam against the zip handling, that leaves us roughly five inches or so that we have all the room in the world that if we're running our electric here, they can spray out the two inches. We can put our electric and stuff through the wall right there. And then we don't have to worry about drywall screws going deep, which that is an awesome bonus of a two by eight wall. Yeah, you put something in the middle, you'll never hit it with a screw or anything. If you're trying to hang something heavy on the wall one day, trying to hang a picture, uh, if there was water lines in there, you're not gonna get a screw that goes that deep to hit your stuff if you put it right in the middle. So huge bonus of two by eight walls if you guys are framing out something and you're not using ICF. That is a huge, huge plus. But uh, again, I think I'm gonna wrap it up here. I think it's a nice little video in the middle of the week for you guys. And uh, please like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time uh, figuring out what the next one's gonna be. Take care.